Hey everyone, Mike from vSwitch Zero here, and welcome to another repair video. So in my hands here I have the FIC4386 VCHD. So 4386, that's kind of weird, right? Is it a 386 board? Is it a 486 board? It's actually both. So this is what's often referred to as a 486-386 hybrid board. And from what I can see, this particular one was made back in 1992. And if you think back to that point in time, you know, 486s were pretty widely available. Um, but as you can imagine, if you did jump on one of those early 486 chips, it meant you were spending some very, very serious money on your system. They were really expensive and not everybody could afford one. But uh, at the time, partly due to the 486s hitting the market, the uh, 386s had actually come down in price quite a bit and were a lot more affordable. But if you did decide to go the 386 route back in 1992, it would have been a huge bonus if you could buy a motherboard, you know, which were also pretty pricey at the time, that gave you some upgrade options. And if you could eventually upgrade to a 486 once they became more affordable, that would really be awesome. So as you can see here in the bottom right hand corner of the board, there's actually an AM386 processor from AMD included on the board. So this one's soldered on and it's in what's called the PQFP packaging, which basically just means that it has legs instead of pins and it's uh, sort of surface mount soldered on there. And uh, aside from some of the special blue lightning chips that are around, this is actually one of the fastest 386 chips that you can get. And just above this uh, soldered on chip here, you can see there's a pretty typical looking uh, PGA socket. And this is where you can actually put your 486 CPU. But uh, the socket is a little a little different than a typical 486 socket because you can actually see there's five rows of pins on each side. And if you were to look at the back of a 486 chip, you'd actually see there's only three rows. So the inner two rows that you see here don't actually connect to a uh, 486 at all. And you can see the silk screening inside here, it does make mention of a 387, which is actually a Mathco processor. So this is sort of a dual purpose socket. You can actually insert your Mathco processor in the center of the uh, socket that just uses the inner two rows of pins, or you can put a, a full blown 486 in here. And it supports pretty much all of them, uh, well, all of the early ones anyway, including the SX, the DX, and even the DX2. So really cool. So the chipset on this board is the VIA VT82C481 and C495 which actually doesn't seem to be all that common. I haven't seen very many boards around that use this chipset, but it does seem to support a number of 386 and 486 chips. And it also supports up to, up to a 40 megahertz bus speed, which you know would make sense since there's a DX40 in here. And the board also has two banks of SIMs, so eight slots of RAM in total. And according to the manual, it actually does take 16 meg SIMs. So in theory, you could put 128 megs of uh, RAM in here, which is a really huge amount for a 386, that's for sure. And I believe there's also uh, 128K of cache in here currently. I can't really call it L2 because there is no L1 on a 386 chip, but I guess you could call it L2 if you had a 486 in the PGA socket. It looks like it's uh, 20 nanosecond stuff in here. I'm not sure how big this uh, tag chip is, but it's probably 8K since there's 128K in there. I might try to do uh, an upgrade in here later on if I can get this up and running. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting looking board overall. And what did I pay for such a unique bit of hybrid CPU history here? It was $8 plus shipping. And I bought this actually about four years ago and just never got around to, uh, to trying it out. But uh, you know, why is it so cheap you might ask? And I'm sure you can already guess. And that's because it is broken. It's physically damaged. And as you can see here, the uh, RTC chip is pretty badly hacked up. The previous owner tried to modify it uh, basically to add an external battery to it. The, uh, the process is you would normally, you know, Dremel a couple of uh, contact spots where you could connect an external battery header and uh, get it up and running again. But uh, if you, you know, I'm not gonna talk too much about RTC modules, by the way, because I, I have spoke about them quite a bit in some of my other videos, but I'll put some links in the description if you'd like to learn more about these and how to get them going again once they're flat. But um, yeah, I mean, where this is physically located on the board, it's pretty much impossible to try to modify it in place. So it's not really surprising that this didn't turn out too well. And you can actually see here too that, um, I'll hopefully get a better close up picture, but one of the tantalum capacitors that are here looks like it got nicked by the Dremel and got split right open like an egg. So that's also gonna be a problem that's gonna need to be fixed there, unfortunately. 
So another interesting thing I found on the board is that there are some blue bodge wires that you can see here. And there's actually a little bare wire bridge that joins these two solder pads down here as well. At first I thought this might have been some kind of a repair attempt that somebody did. And looking at the top side of the board around this area, you can see there's a couple of resistors that are missing and they've actually been cut off. So R8 and R18 that you can see, there still is silk screening there to indicate where they should be. Um, but when I took a look online just to see if this was some kind of a common thing, it looks like all of the pictures of this board or similar boards are missing those resistors as well. So I believe that this is just something done by the factory. There was probably some kind of a design defect that they had to fix. And rather than, you know, creating a whole new PCB revision and, and putting them out there, they just, you know, did a little bit of this uh, bodging uh, at the factory afterwards to resolve that. So yeah, nothing I'm gonna worry about and I'll just ignore it and uh, pretend like it isn't there. So I did just wanna take a moment to say that even though this board was damaged in this attempt and it's really too bad, you know, somebody obviously cared enough about this piece of retro hardware here. It meant something to them that it was, you know, worth going to the trouble to try to get, get it up and running again. They did some research, and I think, you know, they tried their best. And I'm sure there's going to be people out there rolling their eyes over how this was done. But honestly, everybody has a different skill level when it comes to this sort of thing. Not everyone has the right tools for the job, and not everyone has especially experience with soldering and desoldering. And I can tell you, you know, from my own experience, that desoldering can be a royal pain if you don't have the right tools for the job. So yeah, I mean, good on you for at least trying and making an effort. Um, I'm glad that it wasn't just tossed and it wound up on eBay for somebody else to, to pick up and, and try to get it going again. All right, so to get this thing fixed, I'm obviously going to have to remove the RTC module completely. There's no hope for this one, even if I was to remove it and do a battery mod on it. Um, you can see that in, internally down here, there's severed pins and all kinds of damage to the module that uh, there's no coming back from. So this is going to have to be desoldered completely. I'm going to uh, put a socket here because it's not uh, in a location where height would be a problem. It's not in front or behind an ISA slot or anything like that. So yeah, I'll put a socket in here and I'll probably put one of Neckerware's open source uh, custom RTC modules there with the external battery, which uh, I like quite a bit. Again, take a look at the uh, uh, links to the videos in the description for more information on those uh, modules. The, uh, yeah, I'm not too worried about this. I mean, I've done these replacements before. They're not too difficult with the right tools. What I am more concerned about is this uh, tantalum capacitor up here. Unfortunately, because of how it was damaged, I can't actually see the value of you know the the uh, capacitance rating or the voltage rating, but uh, thankfully there is another one right next to it that looks actually almost exactly the same. And you know, in order to better understand how this should be replaced, I should really know what it does first of all. But you can see here, and I'll just flip the board over so you can actually sort of follow the traces. So yeah, looking at the traces here, these appear to be filtering caps. So you can see that uh, the good capacitor is actually connected to the fourth pin up from the P8 connector, which is one of the two AT power connectors that goes to the power supply. And that is actually a negative 12 volt rail. And you can see that the, uh, the trace actually connects to the negative leg of the cap, which is a good indication that it is an, a negative voltage rail for sure. The uh, bad capacitor is the next pin down, the third one from the bottom of the P8 connector. And that one's actually uh, positive 12 volts. So um, you gotta remember on old systems like this, uh, positive and negative 12 volts really weren't used for very much on the motherboard. Um, they are both delivered to the ISA slots for any components that might need it. Uh, I think 12, negative 12 volts might be used for serial ports as well but not anything that would really draw a lot of power. I mean, these old boards, they don't even have fan headers that would use 12 volts. So it does kind of make sense that they would use a similar uh, rated capacitor for both of those two rails. And given the fact that they both sort of have the same physical characteristics and look the same, I think it's a pretty safe bet to assume that they, they were actually the same value, which is 10, uh, 10 microfarads and 25 volt uh, rate rating. Because it's a, a 12 volt or negative 12 volt rail, 25 volts is um, a little bit overkill. You probably could get away with 16, but you know, uh, 25 is definitely better. So that's what I'll, I'll replace it with. So whenever I do desoldering in the past, I would use normal copper wick like this, which is just braided copper that you apply heat to and it will suck up some of the solder, as well as manual pumps like this, which also uh, do work. You know, you just heat up the, uh, the solder and it extracts it that way. So um, good tools to have. If you're only doing it, you know, very occasionally, um, at the very least you would need something like this. But um, I find that, you know, it, 
it does take a long time to to get the job done and quite often I'm applying a bit too much heat as well in the process trying to do it. So recently I did finally pick up a proper desoldering gun. So this is the Hakko FR301. Uh, I heard a lot of good things about it and I think I'm desoldering often enough now that it was worth the investment to get a good one. There are you know quite a few different cheaper models out there that you can also get. Um, but I find that this thing is like a total game changer when it comes to desoldering. So just some advice, if you are planning to do this more than, you know, once in a, in a blue moon, definitely make the investment, get a proper desoldering gun. It makes a, a real world of difference. Oh wow, that came out way easier than I expected actually. Sometimes you have to pry at them a little bit. But yeah, there's the module and you can get a better view of the damage here. You can see, actually it doesn't look like any pins got severed, but it's damaged pretty bad. So I'm pretty happy with how the desoldering gun did. It removed almost all the solder. There's just a tiny little bit around some of the, the holes here. So I'm gonna use some solder wick to clean those up. And then I'll use isopropyl alcohol around this whole area just to get rid of all the, the dust that the dremeling did and that sort of thing. So I've heard that when these tantalum capacitors fail, sometimes they short out. So I'm just curious to see what the resistance is across the pins. And it's actually a very, very high resistance. It's not in infinity, but yeah, it looks like there would be a little bit of current leakage if uh, this thing was powered on. I'm just gonna check the good cap here as well for comparison. Yeah, so that's what I expect to see there. So kind of interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I can't check the capacitance value while it's soldered on, but I will try that uh, once it's removed just to see what it's uh, still if it's still registering anything at all. All right, so let's get this thing removed. And there it is, it fell right out of the board and onto the mat. So let's see if there's any capacitance left in this thing whatsoever. So I'm just gonna use my multimeter here to check the, across the two legs and see what we get. And yeah, pretty much nothing at all. We're talking like half a nanofarad. So this thing is completely toast. All right, so my replacement capacitors just arrived from DigiKey. Um, it was actually the only thing I needed to buy. So the shipping was like four times the cost of these. They're about $1.50 each, so more than an electrolytic, but um, still pretty cheap if you only need to replace a couple of them. Uh, these ones here are from a company called Kyocera, which is a pretty well-known uh, brand. And I'm not sure if you can see it too well there, but there is a little... Um, a line that goes down to indicate which of the two legs is positive, the longer of the two. And unlike electrolytics, which uh, mark the negative leg, so just something to keep in mind there. But yeah, this uh, should do the trick. I'm just going to insert it in the board real quick because I think the size is just a little larger than what was there. Let's just see what it looks like once it's inserted. There we go. I think that actually blends in pretty good. All right, so let's get this thing soldered in here. So I'm definitely not an expert when it comes to soldering, but I think that turned out really clean. And the tantalum capacitor blends in perfectly. You'd never know it was replaced, which is perfect. So next we're gonna deal with the socket here. So these are just standard 24 pin dip sockets. I'm gonna remove a few of the pins because they're basically no connect pins. And I'm not sure if you saw it earlier, but uh, those holes on the board are still sort of sealed with solder. So I'm just gonna remove the pins like this. Really easy to do. And once you've got all the required pins removed, it looks a little something like this. So yeah, looks good, fits perfectly. So the next thing I'm gonna do is just tape it down so that uh, it doesn't move around when I try to solder it from the rear of the board. 
You can try to prop it up somehow from beneath, but uh, I find it's just easier to just tape it like this. So after giving it a good cleaning with IPA, I think it looks really great. I'm quite happy with the result, and I think I'm actually getting a little bit better at this uh, soldering thing. So practice makes perfect, as with anything. And yeah, so let's get this RTC module in and see how it does. So again, I'm going to use one of Neckerware's uh, custom RTC modules here. It's one of his open source projects. And uh, check the video description if you'd like to learn more about how to construct one of these for yourself. And I've done a few tweaks. This time I'm using round pin headers instead of square ones, which seem to be a lot easier on the socket. And this time around, I'm also going to try a Dallas DS12885 chip instead of the normal benchmark one that I've used in the past. So after all that hard work, it's finally time for the moment of truth. Let's get this thing powered up for the first time. So I've got nothing but uh, an ISA uh, video card in here, an ATI Mach 32, just to keep things as simple as possible. But yeah, it looks like this thing is dead as a doornail. I get no post beeps, no display, nothing whatsoever. Um, I can see that the CPU is getting warm, so that's a good sign. So is the cache memory in the north bridge. But yeah, absolutely nothing but a blinking monitor light that tells me there's no signal so there's definitely something very wrong here so it's time to break out the trusty post analyzer card here so this will basically just tell you if there are any postcodes coming from the bios at all during boot up sometimes it can help you uh, understand where it's hanging up it's also got some leds here that'll tell you the various voltage rails if they're okay and also if there's any communication or messaging happening there so i'm going to try to boot up with this card in and see if we can figure out where it's hanging up And yeah, unfortunately I see no postcodes whatsoever, just dashes across all the segment displays, which tells me that there's absolutely no activity whatsoever. So that's a bit troubling, unfortunately. So before I start digging any deeper into the troubleshooting, I did want to try to replace the RTC module that I constructed here. This is the first time I've uh, used this Dallas DS12885 chip, so I honestly don't know if it works. I also bought these for really cheap on eBay, so I'm a little bit suspect of their quality. Um, could have also been a construction problem. Maybe I didn't make good contact on one of the legs, but uh, thankfully I did construct a couple of them, including this one here that uses the uh, benchmark chip that I know came from a good batch. And uh, yeah, let's try this and see if we see any different behavior. All right, right away I see some flashing activity lights and we've got some postcodes, so that's awesome. And the display has sprung to life, and oh man, that PC speaker sound is just music to my ears. So the system has finally posted. Obviously, I'll have to get into the BIOS and set everything up again because the old module has been dead for a very long time. But yeah, I'm actually surprised that the system was that dead without a functioning RTC uh, chip. So that's uh, kind of interesting to me. I never knew that uh, it was such an essential piece for the post process. But yeah, it doesn't make any progress at all without it. So yeah, this is fantastic. I'm gonna do some more testing and see how this thing does. So that's it for today. Thanks very much for watching, but I'm definitely not done with this board yet. There's still quite a few things I'd like to do with it. Once I've got it tested, make sure it's working properly. I'm gonna upgrade the RAM, upgrade the cache, try out a Mathco processor in it, and also a 486. So stay tuned for more. And as always, please like and subscribe if you'd like to see more retro content like this. Thanks very much.